I have been reading the Washington Post since I was seven years old. <laughs> and um, I've been a subscriber for years. So if my mother in heaven knew that I was introducing the chairman of the Washington Post, she would be very, very impressed. So the chairman of the Washington Post graduated from Harvard, uh, served our country in Vietnam, thank you, Don, uh, was a policeman in Washington, D.C., and now he is devoting his life to serving humanity and those far less fortunate than all of us sitting here today. Without further ado, Don Graham. Don. <clears throat> thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm honored to be here, and I'm not kidding. Uh, I'm a kind of honorary Chicagoan, and the story starts in 1938. My mother, Catherine Graham, was a humble college student attending Vassar, and she told me that on a train ride somewhere, she knew she wanted to transfer from Vassar, and she saw a picture of Robert Maynard Hutchins in Red Book. And so she transferred to the University of Chicago, became a life trustee, and has a dorm named after her there. And I'm also the father of a U of C grad. This makes me humble about talking to you. I know just enough about the Chicago civic and business community to understand how amazing it is. Uh, as I understand it, for years, mayors come and go a little more than they used to, <laughs> I am told, but Chicago has a civic and business community that tries to help regardless of who is in power. That's what I believe, and if it's not true anymore, please don't tell me. <laughs> so I know that I'm in the city that works, and I come from the city where nothing happens. <laughs> and absolutely nothing is happening today. I want to talk about a subject that I think is of interest to everyone in this room, business people, professionals, educators, nonprofit people. I want to talk about motivation. Motivation is what we would like to give our children. It's what we'd love to have in the people who work with us. For educators, every teacher wants the motivated students in their class. Last night, I met a young woman from Chicago whom I had never met before. She is a dreamer, which means that she is the daughter of undocumented parents. Uh, therefore, when she wanted to go to college, she got no federal aid. Here in Illinois, she got no state aid. And she could not borrow a cent. I know that the amount of debt that many students leave college with is a huge concern to many people around this room. The dreamers cannot borrow a dollar from anyone. OK? So the young lady I met last night was part of a family. She and her older sister decided that they would pool their earnings so that she could go to one of your community colleges. They didn't earn much. Their earnings allowed her to take one course at a time. She took that course, worked on the side, earned money for the next semester. She worked her way to an associate's degree in 11 years. And now that she has got her associate's degree and has one of our scholarships and is a student at a local college headed for a BA, her sister is starting through the same community college one course at a time. That is motivation. Also in this room is a young woman who in another state was admitted to her local college on her 27th visit to the admissions office. 
a demonstration of motivation that impressed the president of the college enough that I believe he paid for her first semester personally, just thinking I want somebody that motivated. Uh, and meet the dreamers. I love this country, and I know I speak for everyone in this room. We start off speaking the Star Spangled Banner. I was, as, uh, as was said, I, was, I served in Vietnam. My service was completely without value to the United States Army, but very valuable to me. And I served as a policeman in Washington, and I can say after careful observation that I did not at that time arrest anyone now in the room. <laughs> but I want to talk to you about one thing our wonderful country is doing that is just plain wrong. Uh, all over America, all over Chicago, all over the state of Illinois, uh, high school students are being told by their own counselors, you can't go to college. There is no way you can do it. You can't pay for it, forget it. Because they're dreamers, they're the children of undocumented immigrants, and they cannot get any of the federal or state aid programs that I described. If those programs, if the shutdown of the federal government meant for a year, that no student in the Chicago public schools could get federal or state aid, no low-income kid could afford to go to college. You know that. Uh, low-income kids can go to college because of those wonderful aid programs. The dreamers had no choice about who they are. Our average scholar, we got a wonderful data person now, the average one of our 3,400 scholars came to the United States with their parents when they were four years old. We met one last night who came here at four months. A lot of them came in diapers or came in a stroller. It wasn't up to them. Often, they grow up not knowing the family is undocumented. They think they're American citizens like everyone else in the class. No family would tell an eight-year-old that the family is, as Trump would say, illegal because you know an eight-year-old is gonna tell somebody and who is, who you don't quite sure who they're gonna tell. Uh, once they come here in this status, they are stuck. There is no form they can fill out, no line they can get in, no fee they can pay, no lawyer to put in a form for them to get them status. They cannot become a citizen, they cannot get a green card, they cannot be anything but undocumented. How many students are we talking about? Well, back in 2012, a former Chicagoan, Barack Obama, uh, put out an executive order called DACA. Only the government could come up with such a hideous name. <laughs> so, but I think it's beautiful, the program. Uh, I'm not a fan of every single thing President Obama did, but he had a grand slam home run with DACA. If a student had come to the United States before 2007, which is now 11 years ago, it was then five years ago, uh, and graduated from a US high school and had no criminal convictions, no felony convictions, and no serious misdemeanor convictions, meaning 30 days in jail or more, one DUI and you're out, one, sex, one uh, domestic assault conviction and you're out. So, uh, there are 37,000 such young people in your state. 37,000, that's a lot of high school classes. 700,000 in the United States. Been here forever, been good people. So immigration, I, I do not need to say this week, immigration is a rather controversial subject in the United States, and people have very, very strong views about it. Americans don't like it when undocumented immigrants come here and commit crimes, fine. I can introduce them to 7, 700,000 young people who have not done that. And if they commit a crime, they lose DACA. They're out, of the, they're out of the program. Many Americans don't like it when undocumented immigrants come and seek federal or state benefits. But DACA brings its recipients no benefits, not a dollar. When you get DACA, you still can't get any of those grants or loans. 
which is a little crazy. The federal loan program makes money for the United States, but they can't even get that. So I know there's people in this room. One of the big subjects in rooms full of nonprofits like this is, is college worth it anymore? Aren't there other credentials? Aren't there better ways to prepare students for the workforce? Don't put that subject in front of a dreamer. Somebody's told them they can't go to college, and they want to go, and once they get in, they are very hard to get out of college. Uh, we accept applications from five years ago, a couple of friends and I uh, co-founded the dream.us, now the largest scholarship program for dreamers in the United States. We accept applications from dreamers with DACA, now from some others as well. And we offer them scholarships to the best low-cost colleges in the United States. Our scholarships are a mighty $8,250 a year. So any classmate with a Pell Grant and an Illinois State Grant has more aid than, uh, than any of our dreamers. Is 8,250 enough to get a student through college? Well, here's the results in Illinois so far. This is all the students who've started at all our partner colleges in Illinois since four years ago. 93% still in college. I'm not talking graduation rates because we aren't that old. Our, our youngest students uh, started just three years ago. 97% uh, at the amazing Dominican University whose president Donna Carroll is here. 100% at National Lewis University, and Scott Smith, one of their board members, is here. I think the 93% retention rate of these Dreamer students over several years is probably higher than the rate at Champaign-Urbana, and that is one of the strongest retention rates in the United States of America. Uh, our Dreamers are amazing. We aren't the only people in Chicago aiding them. Uh, you know how lucky you are to be co-citizens with Brian Traubert and Penny, Penny Pritzker. They uh, run a program at the Noble Street schools that aids dreamers who've graduated from there, many of whom go to many of the schools represented at these tables. They are the, one of the three largest grantors of scholarships to dreamers in the whole country, and all their work is in Chicago. Uh, the most generous people to dreamers are America's colleges and universities. Uh, unique are the students at DePaul and at Loyola, where the students voted 70 to 30 for a $2.50 fee that they would pay themselves to give financial aid to dreamers. Uh, I some kind of cheered for Loyola last year. <laughs> okay, now for a little Illinois problem. If you come to the city club, you gotta come with a little Chicago problem, and I have one that would interest you. So California has far more DACA recipients than any other state, no surprise. Texas is second. Illinois is third. Uh, and this is, goes back to persistence. Our whole program, nationally, we've got an 86% persistence rate among kids with no money, which is higher than the 76% of American college students. So take a look at the three states listed here. They are three, four, five in the number of DACA recipients. Uh, Illinois has more than New York or Florida. But as far as our scholars go, with under 200 dreamers in college, uh, we have fewer students attending college in Illinois by far than in New York where we have almost 1,000, or Florida where we have almost 600. Why? Uh, you got a problem here. CUNY, with 18 different campuses, the City University of New York costs exactly 7,000 a year. If you throw in the fees, it costs 7,200. Our scholarship, as I said, is $8,250 a year, so the CUNY student is paid tuition and fees and a little bit to apply to books and all the other costs of going to college. Uh, Florida 
Miami-Dade College in Florida, I'll admit, is an outlier. Its in-state tuition is $3,000 a year, and that is a very unusual story. It's a remarkable place. It's also the largest university in the United States with 165,000 students. You can win a bet in a lot of bars tonight on that. <laughs> but Florida International is a good state four-year university with a $6,000 a year tuition. Not every city has a six or $7,000 a year college, but many do. We are sending our students to college for that price in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in Houston, in Dallas, every other city in Texas, and many other places around the country. In Chicago, the cheapest places we can find are 10 or 11, and uh, with one exception, which is Father Katsouris' magnificent Arupe College, a new arrival, uh, which welcomes our dreamers uh, at our price but isn't, doesn't quite have 165,000 students yet. Uh, we we uh, won't argue that the price of a college is all important. If Chicago had a city, a community, a four-year college with say a $7,000 a year tuition price and say 75,000 students, it would be a different city. I'm not saying that that would be easy to do. I come from Washington, D.C., no such college. Baltimore, no such college. Philadelphia, no such college. But it's, uh, it's a great thing to have if you can find a way to it. Uh, even in faraway Washington, D.C., I've heard you have a few financial problems in Illinois, so I know there are reasons you can't immediately address this. To conclude, I want to ask the people in this room for three things. First, some of you are employers. You run companies, you run nonprofits, you run arts organizations, universities, whatever. If you want a supply of the most motivated people you'll ever meet, Candy Marshall, Gabby Pacheco, and I are so eager to connect you with people who want to be your interns this summer and your employees when they graduate. The dreamers will be as hard working for you as they are for your college degree. I will give you a gold-plated guarantee of that. You cannot stop these young people. Uh, second, <clears throat> to talk politics for just a minute, uh, I would love to see the dreamers get a path to citizenship. Yeah. You may have noticed that President Trump rather wants to get his, some money for his so-called wall, and I wish he would do it by offering the dreamers that path to citizenship and also, and crucially, offering safety for the young people with TPS, temporary protected status. Most of you know what that is. They're all over Chicago, and they run out of a right to work next July unless we are able to do something about it. That would be a compromise I at least could vote for, and I hope some of your members of Congress could too. Finally, we need you. I'd love to get your help. This fall, after Candy finishes uh, bringing in applications, we have the money to send 1,000 Dreamers to uh, colleges around the country. If any of you can give us $33,000 over the next four years, we'll make it 1,001. If you want that one extra person to be in Chicago, there's no place we got a bigger backlog of dreamers. And we would love to get your help any way you can. But this city is great. It's been great to the people who grew up here and who work here. And thanks to the church, thanks to the business community, thanks to all of you, it's been great to the dreamers as well. And we're going to find a way to give them what they want and what they need. Thank you very much. So, John's got an acceptably loud voice, I find. 
So we, we met uh, well over 20 years ago at Allen and Company Conference. And uh, at one time, you and I were bidding for the same company. And we won. For me, you won. And it's now in, it's in bankruptcy. I hope you know that. <laughs> I appreciate you not outbidding us, so thank you. Uh, and I, when we met, you were a publisher of the Washington Post, about to become chairman. And we've, we've interacted every year since then. We, we've gotten to be good friends. But I learned a few things in reading your resume and Jay's introduction. When you graduated from Harvard, that's the same year I graduated from Denison, instead of going to graduate school to avoid the draft like I did, you got drafted. Yeah. And it's a private. And you went to Vietnam, you can get shot doing that. Yeah. What were you thinking? Well, I, I uh, like you, I was born in the very critical year 1945 in Washington, D.C. And I grew up in the household of Philip and Catherine Graham. My dad had been a major in the Air Force in World War II. His dad had been a captain in the Army in World War I. And uh, I, I, I had a crazy early life. I knew the people running the country in those days better than I do now. And it was a smaller city and people interacted more. And I, did, I wasn't crazy about the war in Vietnam, but I wasn't, uh, I knew the people running the country and, running, and who'd gotten us into that war were very decent people. And I didn't think it was great for us to break our word and walk away. And I also knew that if I didn't, go, some other citizen of Chicago or DC would get drafted in my place. So it's an interesting story. Vietnam, no Vietnam veteran has ever been president, but uh, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump, none of whom quite made themselves available for the draft, uh, uh, have, all been, running for have all been. Well, McCain, Gore, and Kerry were okay. all Vietnam veterans and all lost. lost. Now, you get out of the army, and then instead of going to a cushy job at your family-controlled newspaper, you become a patrolman in Washington, D.C. What, what were you thinking there? Well, I was, uh, I, I can tell you exactly what I was thinking. I was discharged from the army back in the U.S. in Jan July of 68. Washington had had a three-day riot in April of 1968 after Dr. King was killed. It, it, a lot of people were killed in that riot. Three whole corridors of real estate of uh, streets in D.C. were burned to the ground. Chicago had similar outbursts from yeah. time to time. And I came back and I said to myself, I don't understand one bit about this city. Uh, for the teachers who were here, I tried to become a public school teacher and I was told that I could not because I didn't have an education degree which was required at the time. So as I occasionally say to my teacher friends, I joined Arrest for America. And uh, <laughs> I, I, became, I became a cop, and I'm, I wanted, uh, not because I wanted to learn about the cops, but because I wanted to learn about the city. Thank you, and I'm so glad I did. I worked with great people, and uh, uh, I learned a ton. And after you served as a patrolman, Instead of getting a cushy job at the paper, he became a reporter. Well, that was, that's how I, I grew up uh, hero worshiping my dad. And I was a newspaper kid like several other people I know in this room. I was the editor of my high school paper and my college paper. And I and unfortunately spent much more time in college on the newspaper, which was a non-credit activity that I did in class. But don't tell my, <laughs> don't tell my children. So there's a common thread among all those things. You passed up opportunities to escape services, and you yeah. kind of got to work with the common man. And yeah. how, was all, how does all those experiences shape, shape who you've become today, and maybe how you got involved in the, the Dream USA? Well, I feel <laughs> lucky as hell. And I, think, I don't think there's one person in this room who doesn't understand what I'm saying. By getting drafted into the Army, I met people from small towns, I met people from farms, I met people from inner cities, I met people from the west, the south, the east. And then as a cop, I mean, I kind of got a little feel for how Washington worked. Uh, I feel a little sorry today for these very elite kids who go to Andover and then to Brown and then to Accenture and then to Harvard Business School and then to Goldman Sachs and would never meet a truck driver, would never 
would never know that the truck driver is very likely as good a person as they are, and that they damn well couldn't do his job as well as he does or she does. Uh, so, yeah. uh, I have a, a theory that I promise you will never come to reality, but just think about this. In the draft in our day, as John referred to, you could get a, you, everybody was up for being drafted, but you could get a so-called deferment if you had bad health, like say a bone spur on your heel or <laughs> whatnot. Or if you were going to certain, you know, doctors were deferred, but uh, 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 graduate students were deferred, married people were deferred. And uh, so ba basically most wealthy people got out of it. I would like to see us reinstitute a military draft and exempt poor people. I would like to see rich people get drafted. Uh, say, I would exempt people who ever had a Pell Grant, I would exempt people who ever had free and reduced lunch, but I would draft people who were graduates of great four-year colleges and let them defend this country. And uh, they enjoy, it's, it's, as I say, you, you listen to many political proposals, and this one, I can guarantee you, will not happen. Would you uh, exempt private equity professionals? Well, those are following a sacred calling, John. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. So you, um, there, you uh, uh, had a little experience in the uh, tech world and, and joining Facebook's board and serving a, and did. Facebook's board for six years. And some said you were a great resource and, and even a mentor to Mark Zuckerberg. How, how was that experience? I and learned so much more from Mark than he learned from me. I got pretty strong. I've, I've got uh, eccentric feelings about this. I joined the Facebook board in 2009. I actually met Mark Zuckerberg when he was 20. And I met Sheryl Sandberg when she was coming right out of the Clinton administration, and I tried and failed to hire her. I have quite a record of failure at, at <laughs> Facebook. And uh, I tried to buy 10% of Facebook for $6 million in 2005 and didn't quite bring that off. But uh, I was on that board for six years. I haven't been on it for three, so I do not know what has happened in this whole period. I know this. Everybody and their brother is piling on Facebook at this point. And uh, I'm not, uh, Facebook has done plenty wrong and has plenty to fix. But the people waving their fists now uh, have all the courage of the last guy at a Bears game who jumps on the pile after the runner is already down. You know, you, the, the people who were criticizing Facebook in 2011 when it was red hot, I have a lot of admiration for, and I know those people, but uh, the ones yelling and screaming the loudest. Now, some of them were cheering loudly, you know, were on Facebook's side when it was making a lot of money. Mark and Cheryl are very high quality people, and I would bet on them solving a lot of the problems associated with the company, but we'll see. I referred to the Allen & Company conference, um, and uh, every year for 30 years, they would have presentations by companies that weren't public yet, they had new ideas, yeah. and we got to see Google before it became what it is today. We got to see Airbnb. We got, I never forget seeing it, coming back for, you know, for the afternoon and saying, that's the dumbest idea. Nobody's <laughs> going to stay in somebody's bedroom. Yeah. I, I wouldn't buy that stock in you a You passed on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah, no, Google, what? That's, you know, it's got a So many name. search yeah. engines yeah. already. Get a, get yeah. A, get, a, get, a, get a real name. So that we've, I've, had, I've had some pretty good forecasting in connection with that, so I know what you mean yeah, there. Don't listen to this guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So, big year 2013, you decide to sell the Washington Post yep. to uh, Jeffrey Bezos. What, right. what brought well, you to that? And uh, There's some people in this room who know the newspaper business pretty well. Yeah. And I was the publisher of the Post for 21 years, ending in 2001, and it was fabulous, and I loved every minute of it. Uh, it's a long story, but even in the years before there was an internet, newspaper circulation started to go down, and we didn't do anything about it. These irritating younger people 
I hate you. <laughs> Old people like John and me, we yeah, loved yeah. reading newspapers, and these damn 40-year-olds wanted their news online. And we, we did our best, but my poor niece became the publisher of the Post in February of 2008. She did not have an up month. And five years later, she came to me and said, Don, the next five years are gonna be just like the last five years, and we should look and see if there is someone who could bring something to the post that we don't have. So we did not put it up for sale, but we started discreetly talking to a few people, and Jeff was first on our list. Uh, evidence is mounting that Jeff Bezos knows a little more about technology than I do. And uh, newspapers need a lot of things, but boy, do they need technology. And uh, Jeff, I mean, the first thing I noticed after Jeff took over the paper was the speed to load the site just went to lightning, you know. He, he, got, the, he got it, you know, he understood. And uh, we were not able to achieve that. He brought resources that we couldn't bring. So I, I'm not happy that we couldn't solve the problems of the post, but knock on wood, Jeff would tell you he mm -hmm. doesn't have the answer yet. But uh, he's, been a fa he's been a great owner. Now that's the same year you co-founded uh, the Dream US. Yeah. So what, was there a cause and effect? Or I'd was been, it? No, there was no cause and effect. I'd been running a scholarship program in Washington, D.C. I'm sure there's a counterpart program in Chicago. I was running a classic college access program for all the high school uh, seniors, public and charter in Washington. And uh, we, Washington, we're not a state. I don't know if you've uh, ever known that. <laughs> like, I don't, I've never, I'm 73 and I don't have, I've never had a senator. Uh, I don't know that it does much good these days, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I've never voted for a member of Congress and that still makes me mad. But the terrible thing about not being a state is we were out of state everywhere. So a bunch of the larger businesses in town set up a scholarship fund and went to the federal government and said, give these kids a small scholarship program to pay part of the difference between in-state and out-of-state at the state schools. And that worked. I mean, the DC public school students, it turned out, wanted to go to college very badly, but couldn't pay. So the, everybody's uh, enrollment numbers went up, everybody's graduation went up, except the dreamers. And I said to myself, this is strange. These are salutatorians. These are class presidents. How come they can't go to college? So I started learning. Then I met some dreamers. And in June of 2013, I met Gabby Pacheco, who's here with me today. And uh, Gabby is ever so slightly motivated as a dreamer. She and three fellow graduates of Miami-Dade walked from Miami to Washington in 2009 when they all could have been deported. There was no DACA to stop in every small town and talk to the newspaper and talk to the radio station and tell them about the educational plight of the dreamers. And uh, so Gabby and I and then Candy Marshall, the three of us started this program together with Henry Munoz and Carlos Gutierrez in the fall of, of 2013. And uh, we just, you know, we put money into it. We've raised money from others. And I told you what I think of the dreamers. Uh, how many co-founders? Um, Three. And who, and who? Henry, Henry is a second generation head of an architecture firm in San Antonio. Uh, he is also, poor man, the finance chair of the Democratic National Committee, which is about the worst job I could imagine. <laughs> but by good luck, the other co-founder was Carlos Gutierrez, whom you know, yes. who was the Secretary of Commerce under President Bush, the longtime CEO of Kellogg, and was a Republican. So. It's against the law in Washington, but we had a Democrat and a Republican involved. <laughs> and don't tell anyone. Uh, but, you know, we, they were from Florida and Texas, which had far more dreamers than we did, and we just put our heads together. Henry started off by, first he introduced me to Gabby, and then he introduced me to Brian Traubert. That was pretty good. Yeah, and so then we got going. So you, you alluded to this, your second point, and you, we, we've kind of, well, yeah. you, um, and co-authored an op-ed piece in the Washington Post yeah. with Newt Gingrich. Yeah, the people, only one of my entire life. Which uh, called for the wall, for the, what you just alluded to. Yeah. Let's build the stupid wall, but let's solve the dreamer problem. Newt and it thinks, seems to be, uh, Newt thinks, now, now this was quite a while ago, yeah. and now it seems to be the only off-ramp for two entrenched parties. Uh, well, I saw the Chicago Tribune at an editorial day before yesterday recommending exactly that, and so did the Wall Street Journal. 
But uh, I'm, uh, I wish we could do that. Uh, but when the president gets on TV and says nothing but negative things about the Democrats, and then the Democrats get on TV and say nothing but negative things about the Republicans, I'm a member of the smallest minority group in Washington. I think the Democrats are right about some things, and I think the Republicans are right about some things, and nobody in town agrees with me. You're in one side or the other these days. And uh, uh, I do not agree on much with Newt Gingrich, but he has been a friend of our program since the day we started. And he, he was uh, for the Dreamers getting in-state tuition in, in his state, and he paid a political price for it when he ran for president in 2012. He got clobbered by Mitt Romney for it. So, yeah, I wish uh, the president and Congress would make a deal. I'm, uh, Newt's a fan of the wall. I, you know, I would say it might be something of a waste of money, like all of it. Uh, but, <laughs> but I'll tell you something, the dreamers will make that money back so fast it'll make your head spin, you know. And if, this, if we don't do a deal to get them status, I'm afraid we're telling them, wait. The Dream Act was introduced for the first time in the year 2001. Clara Saul is here, who is the chief of staff to Senator Durbin, who introduced it. It has never passed, never. It always comes close. And please, God, maybe this time we could, uh, we could achieve that. So, um, what, what's your, I want, uh, we're with really big shoulders. Yeah. I have my own scholarship program. We want to move we, you to Washington. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't know how many DACA students we have, but we know we have a lot. You got a lot. And uh, we, Josh and myself, we work on getting kids into college. We know the problem these kids have. It's, it, you know, it's really an interesting fact. They find out they're DACA students when they're 15 and 20 for the reason you said. It's hidden from them because they're liable to tell their classmates, not with any evil intent, but just yeah. chatting. So it's a big shock to them. And then they realize they can't get any aid to go to college and they're really hamstrung and it's a, it's a terrible thing. What do you, how, do you, how are your college partners, what do you see the future with the college? I mean, it seems like you've had a lot of receptivity the best friends of dreamers in the United States are educators. I don't know if I've met one who isn't sympathetic. And uh, just on our trip to Illinois, we stopped out at Dominican yesterday. Candy was at Northeast Illinois today. We're going to Arupe tomorrow. I've, I've spent as much time with Father Steve Katsouris as any other educator, but I haven't been to his wonderful college. I'm dying to see it. And uh, National Lewis has been a great partner, and UIC has been a great partner. We, uh, we, the interest in helping students is very, very high. And we're just going to keep on looking for ways to do it. But again, we could use your help. 33 grand at a crack. We probably are the cheapest scholarship program where we pretty well guarantee you a finished product. The, uh, the uh, dreamer we put in college we saw that 93% are still in college, so that's a pretty good, on the whole, we consider that pretty good. And uh, I, th you know, at some point, this country has to address this. And the issue is, of course, much bigger than the dreamers. There's 11 million undocumented, some number of undocumented immigrants here. In the president's head, it seems to vary by 10 or 20 million a week. Uh, but nobody knows, he's right about that, how many undocumented people are here. There's a lot of undocumented people who are the parents of our dreamers, who have lived here for decades, done no wrong, paid their taxes, worked hard, and been wonderful citizens. And the idea of any of them being deported just galls me. I make no case for anybody who comes here and commits a felony, none. I'm fine with that. And I'm, uh, I'm fine with securing our border but I'm not fine with treating the dreamers the way we do. I'm not fine with treating other students the way we do. And I wish to God we could help uh, the good people who lived here so long and been punished so badly. Now let's talk about how the program works. Uh, um, yeah. how, does, how, do, how does a student, how do the students be even become aware of the program? Well, that's it. we've been asking the dreamers that question while we've been here. The, the, the weakest part of our program is we have no advertising budget. Our advertising consists of Gabby getting on social media and waving her arms and telling people that. Are, so right now, through the end of February, 
our application round is open for freshmen entering next fall. So any student with DACA or Candy, correct me if I'm wrong, any student who will tell us that they'd have been eligible for DACA had they been able to apply, that with the, you can't apply now, uh, and uh, or uh, that, but they they meet the qualifications, principally the one that you haven't committed a crime. Uh, we'll take an application from. Uh, our basic application, the way we make ourselves known is called Google. If you look for scholarships for Dreamers or scholarships for DACA, we come up number one. And uh, then we do not choose the scholars. That's just basic part of being a nonprofit. You don't pick the beneficiaries. So we've got college admissions people, uh, uh, high school counselors, Dreamers, advocates, if you want to volunteer to help us, being on that selection committee, God help you, because uh, choosing among these kids is impossible, but uh, being on that selection committee is a great way to help. And then uh, we will send out notifications. You get about a 90% acceptance rate, and those who don't accept, typically it's because they got a scholarship to MIT or someplace, and I can't argue with that. So. Uh What's, what are the what are the numbers? Do you ha how many applications do you get? And and uh, we get we get and, we'll get uh, about twenty five hundred applications for twelve for eleven hundred places. And it's a four year scholarship. Yeah. So is there any uh, obligation? Is there a contract or obligation of the students? Do they have to do X, Y, or Z to retain the scholarship? No. Uh, no we grades, understand. no? No. Well, they have to, meet, they have to uh, remain in good standing and have a 2.5 GPA, but we will, if, uh, the, 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 base, the most common reason for not carrying a 2.5 GPA is I was working 50 hours a week mm -hmm. or I got sick. And we listen. We're hum we have human beings on the other end of the phone and we listen to those. But uh, the, uh, uh, the Dreamers are a very practical bunch. The, the largest number major in health careers. We have, there's somebody here from Loyola Medical School. God bless that place. Uh, which, so Loyola takes more medical uh, students than any other med school in the country from the Dreamer population. And uh, uh, we, we uh, we have a lot of pre-meds. We have a lot of health careers. We got a lot of aspiring teachers. There are, Teach for America alone has 300 uh, Dreamer teachers, and all of those Dreamers will have to be fired if DACA goes away. All of those teachers will be fired out of their classrooms if there's no more DACA, and that is probable, in case you don't know. DACA's being propped up by three court decisions, but those judges wrote in their opinions is no doubt the president has the right to rescind DACA. He just didn't do it in proper legal form. And if he goes, so the Supreme Court may say, the president has the right to do this and the legal objections don't, am don't amount to enough to stop him. Or they may say, the judges are right, so the president has to go back to square one. In either case, DACA winds up rescinded. That's one reason I want to compromise so badly. So when you went into this yeah. whole thing, you probably had no way to forecast. And how the heck did you get to over, basically 90% persistence rates That's in college? That's unbelievable. John, that ain't us. That's them. How many people who are here are dreamers? Yeah. So there's a lot of dreamers in this room. Raise your hands again so everybody can see you. Wow. So, So they do not have 90% persistence rates because we or any other program uh, are giving them counseling or mentoring or support of any kind. Their universities are doing fabulously by them. I don't want to underestimate that. They are motivated. Uh, they don't want to let their families down and they understand how good this chance is. And they want to show that they're going to come through. Uh, Gabby Pacheco, who's here with me, learned when she was 15 or 14 that 
she was a dreamer and would not have a chance to go to college. And she said her reaction was, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to show them that they can't stop me, that they've got to take me. And I've heard variants of that from so many dreamers. And that's the way they act. I'm, I sound like I'm fantasizing. I sound like I'm making this up. But go meet them. All right, questions. We got a ton of questions. We have a long history at the City Club of turning you over to the Good. to the audience, and it looks like you may be able to handle yourself. So I'm pretty well, confident. Well, I'll try. Yeah, I know you will. I learned from you, John. Monsignor Velo has the first question. It's one I was going to ask you anyway. So, and it goes to the Post, which was one of my favorite movies of the year. What What was your view of Meryl Streep's portrayal oh, of your wife? Well, I. Uh, <laughs> Steven Spielberg made a movie called The Post, which was about my mother, Catherine Graham, who really was, in her day, the only woman CEO of a Fortune 1000 company, 999 guys in her. Wow. And, uh, and this movie's about the day she decided to print the story of the Pentagon Papers, which was a bet your company decision if there ever was one. And, you know, you can imagine, I was a little nervous when I heard someone was going to make a movie about my mother, but uh, I needn't have worried. Meryl Streep is everything she's cracked up to be. She is so wise, so thoughtful. She did her homework. And I was, I was uh, uh, the movie, some of the movie's true, some of the movie's made up. It has to be. You know, the movie, life doesn't happen in movie form. She's terrific. I mean, that was a great portrayal. What was life like around your house during that Time Watergate and and the and the release of the Pentagon Papers. Well, if papers. you want to, if you want to, uh, uh, the, my mother wrote her autobiography when she retired. It took her six years, and she wrote it by hand, John, on a yellow pad. Oh wow! And uh, it, not a not a way many books get written these days. I think days. they handed it out at the Allen and Company conference, didn't well, they? She, they, they? She spoke about it. Yeah. And uh, it won the Pulitzer Prize for biography that year, deservedly. I mean. What people always say is, she's so honest. She told how she really felt, which was terrified. So as her son and her three other children, when she talked to us, she ran a kind of stream of consciousness thing of what she was thinking about. And I'll tell you, she was terrified. Yeah. I mean, the, the Attorney General of the United States was saying, we're going to take your television stations away from you. You may go to jail, uh, you know. but. She had to make a decision, do you print a story or not print a story? The consequences were going to be pretty awesome either way, and she some kind of made the right call. It looks like Jeff Bezos is going uh, through some of the same thing with the current administration. Well, uh, we'll see about the current administration. I don't want to, I'm not reaching any conclusions about the current administration. Watergate started with a burglary. And as a cop, I had been arresting burglars. And the average burglar in Washington got three to five years. So that was a felony, a serious crime. I'll tell you something interesting about Washington right now. You can see that secrets are not kept for very long in much of the city. You have not read a story with a leak from Robert Mueller or anybody working for Robert Mueller. Nobody knows what that man has found out. <laughs> you, can, you can read Bob Woodward's book, which is the best book I've read. And uh, he, he's got nothing from Mueller. And if he's got nothing from Mueller, no nobody's got, got anything <laughs> yeah, yeah. from Mueller. So let's wait for right. the form conclusions. Got it. All right, we got a lot of questions. Uh, Jim Warren, is Jim in a room? Where's Jim Warren? Uh, he, I think he mailed this one in. All right. I got Hello, an e Warren, wherever you are. Yeah, I got an email from him this morning. I don't think he's here. But anyway, he's, he's here in spirit. Back to your former life. What's your best guess as to any possible future business models for distinctly local, and that's all caps, journalism? Uh, huge question. I've met two people in the last week, and I have no idea whether they're right or not who say we all ought to look at something called the Texas Tribune, founded recently, whose business model is one-third advertising, one-third subscribers, and one-third philanthropy. Hmm. And it's been in existence for a number of years. It does great local reporting in Texas. I don't know a hell of a lot about it, but that, uh, uh, there are people who argue that that's a pretty good model. Yeah. That, that's the model of your NPR station, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Ellen Harris from the Smile Train, great, great, 
uh, not for yep. profit. How is corporate social responsibility woven into your business philosophy? Well, I was, uh, that's easier for me than for John Canning. The Washington Post uh, was for a long time a very profitable business in one city. And if the city fell apart, the Post wasn't going to do well. So I went to work in the DC public schools to do everything I could to help them. And that, uh, that seemed like a great thing to do. I was public about it, so nobody was going to write that we were doing something behind the scenes. But you know, a, a company yep. like yours, which has nationwide responsibilities, that's a more complicated question. Mm -hmm. For the Post, it was pretty simple. Well, it's, it turns out to be good business practice to I incorporate think. that into your... In my life, I would agree with yeah. you, John. And John's lived that, you know. You, I'm sure, know how lucky you are to have big shoulders here. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, I literally, I don't know, I don't know every city in the United States. I don't know anything else like it. It is citizens across Chicago pitching in to help undoubtedly worthy schools and, and uh, educational institutions. So, one, one just interesting, it's true, most major cities are closing a lot of a Catholic lot of schools. schools. Yes, we are. And Cardinal Bernadine, 30 years ago, had the foresight to ask business leaders, including Jim O'Connor, who's still very active, to form a not-for-profit independent of the archdiocese, and that's the key. We don't have demands for cemeteries and sex abuse, abuse claims and, and other th It's big shoulders Big money. shoulders. It's big shoulders money to do with what they will with the single purpose of supporting value-based education in parochial schools, regardless of whether the kids are Catholic or not, and 40% of our kids aren't Catholic. When I became a cop, I immediately noticed that my fellow police, as soon as they got four or five paychecks, uh, they started to think about putting the child in yeah. Catholic school. And that had an effect. I said, ah, I've learned something. We're Pardon? done. Oh, we have to I think it. we've yeah. had it, Canning. I thought, we, I thought we got out of here Big at 1.30. No. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Love it, John. Thank you so much. Good. Good.